Hey everyone, welcome to the Story Making Show. I am thrilled to be with Gary Ware. Gary is a creative yet strategic play consultant, and he helps companies and professional level up their skills. By night, he's also improv comedian. Gary, thank you so much for being with me. Oh my gosh, Jim. Uh, thank you for uh, having me on. Uh, I'm super excited. Yeah, let, let's, let's dive in. I love it. And the topic is the power of play. As a guy who absolutely lives and breathes and eats and sleeps play, I have to ask you just the question other people are probably coming in thinking, why is play so important? We're adults, Gary. Why, why, why is play so important to us here? Oh, have a seat. Where, where do we begin? Uh, well, so it, it's one of those things. My dad, and if you're watching dad, um, you, you know you said this. You, um, I grew up hearing this. Gary, you can play when the work is done. You can play when the work is done. And that that structure definitely helped me, you know, um, get through like the tedious things, you know, called school and whatnot. And then when I became an adult, that became like my mantra. Here's the catch. The work is never done. I don't know about you. My to-do list is, is like... If you've seen the movie Gremlins, it's like uh, when you feed a gremlin after midnight, like they sort of like reproduce. I, I swear my to-do list is having to-do list babies. And uh, so if I followed that mindset of you can only play when the work is done, you never play because the work is never done. And so that's the first thing to let adults know that, hey, guess what? Play is not what we thought. Uh, play is not one dimensional as in goofing off or things like that um, through my own experience of experiencing burnout, of, um, you know, sort of losing my way, so to speak. I, that's how I found play, <laughs> uh, rediscovered play, if you will. And then I realized that play is more. Play is all about connection. Uh, play is a way to um, level up your creativity and curiosity. And so, you know, for those of you who, um, you know, haven't uh, found their way back to play. Uh, I'm here to say you can give yourself permission to play because, um, you know, and we can jump jump into this of the different modalities of play, but play is that thing that will help you power up so that so that you can work more. Because uh, I I'd love to say you can only uh, work from a place of rest. You know, you should, mm. um, you know, rest enough so that you can you know jump back in and, and plays plays the way to do it that's so good so what you're saying is play is a way of recharging and restoring so we can do the work is that essentially in a nutshell yeah that's one that's one aspect of play one aspect okay yeah. now can you share a little bit more of your own personal story with burnout because i i literally was messaging a friend today i said honestly i don't know too many people that aren't overwhelmed like i try to come you know when i'm communicating i try to come at that assumption you know more often than not most of us are very overwhelmed that's not too far off from burnout i'd love to hear more about your personal story yeah so like i said uh i had this mindset of you know you can play when the work is done mm -hmm. um i jumped into my career thinking like wow i get to do <laughs> the thing that i love and here's the thing. It started off as play. It started off as, you know, the work that I did. I saw the world through the lens of a playground. Um, you know, I, you know, jumped into my work every day uh, being like, yeah, yeah, here we go. Well, here's the thing. That became an ongoing thing. I did not uh, implement rest. I did not uh, do the things that were going to recharge me. And then before I knew it, and this is the sneaky thing with burnout is that it sneaks up on you. It is very slippery. And, and, and then I realized that I was more depleted. I was like those old iPhone batteries where, you know, you, you charge it and it's depleted by 11. Um, right. You know, it's, it's running all the processes and, and all those tracking things, whatever the case may be. And all the behind the scenes, you can't behind see the it. scenes. It's just draining it. Yeah. 
And that was me. And then again, I just thought that was par for the course. I would be the person that would be at networking events and like, hey, how are you doing, Garrett? I'm busy. Oh, look at me. I got a lot of stuff going on. It it became like my badge of honor. Um, and the people that were around me, no one, no one was going to be like, you know what, Gary, I think you should you're working a lot. You should you should not work so much. And the people are like, Yeah, look at you. Go get them. Climb that corporate ladder. Right. And it just became my thing. I Again, it was very addicting. Uh, I'm this, like, again, type A personality. At the end of the day, I still wanted to have fun. I still wanted to play. Uh, but something happened. And then I honestly felt like I was broken. I, I, I was like, oh, wow, man, I don't like this work anymore. I What what happened? Um, I was getting into more like sort of bickering, like with my with my partner I mm-hmm. at work. Um, I wasn't as sharp as I could have been. And then, you know, of course, you know, you take the vacation, you're like, Oh, man, I needed a Great. vacation. And most people that are experiencing burnout, the interesting thing about burnout, as I studied it, you don't want to, bur- you don't want to take a vacation. Like it's one of those things where like you just throw yourself in, uh, in even more you um, you know, say, well, you know what, the best way to fix this is to work harder, you know, uh, we'll eventually cl- uh, climb out. And that's what I did. And I trust me, I burnt myself out multiple times. And even after I've learned, like, how play is the answer, just how we're wired. Mm-hmm. Again, you can easily get down that trap. And so um, in this one particular instance, um, I thought, well, you know, I'm not as um, productive as, as I used to be, I'll come in early. Just, mm. I'll, I'll just come in 15, 20 minutes early, you know, get a jump start on the day before people start getting in, before meetings happen, and um, end up staying later. Uh, I'm coming in earlier. I'm staying later. And again, I'm just all like oblivious to what's really going on. Right. Um, and then the thing that was um, a life changer for me is discovering improv. Um, because again, as someone that wanted to optimize his life and be the most efficient person he could, um, I took a Toastmasters class uh, and, and I hated it. Oh my, I hated it so bad. It it was just like, it was again, very effective. If you want to learn basics of public speaking, very effective. However, I didn't feel like I was being me. I felt like I was being a robot. I was being Toastmaster version of Gary and okay. it caused a okay. lot of things. Censored, very specific structure. Yeah. I got you. Right. I was I was judging myself of like, all right, I already said four ums. Oh, they're gonna ding me. I bet <laughs> like That's I just hard. I've I wasn't as effective as I as as I could have been. I learned a lot. It just wasn't for me. And then a mentor said, Gary, improv. Have you considered improv? And I'm like, what? I'm no Wayne Brady. I like I'm not a comedian. I didn't take drama in high school. Right. Why improv? And he said, well, you know, it's a great way to uh, learn how to think on your feet and be creative. And I'm like, "Ah." you know, and the thought like my thought of an improv class was, again, never stepped foot in an improv class. And it's funny when (laughs) when we have this fear, we, we make it this big thing. We have no idea what's really going on, and then our our brains sort of take over, and we tell ourselves this story, and we buy it. And again, I th- uh oh, they're gonna put me on the spot. People are gonna find out like I, you know, I'm this fraud or something. Like I don't know. I was just scared. But when a mentor suggests that you do something, and it's someone that you really like and trust, and and mm-hmm. um, you know, you you do it. You step outside your comfort zone. And I I took that class, and it's funny looking back. I'm like, I had nothing to be scared of. Um, again. Learning about play makes sense because play is a very vulnerable activity. When you're doing yeah. these improv activity, uh, improv games, you're you're playing games. You're being vulnerable. There's a chance that people may make fun of you. However, the way improv is structured, that's not that's not the game. It's all about supporting each other. Nonetheless, mm-hmm. that improv class was the catalyst because of a few things. And again, it wasn't until like looking back years later, I'm like, oh, makes sense. Um, I had a very specific time where I had to do something. <laughs> I, instead of working late, I had to be at a location by 630. Um, and so, so I had to cut off work. I had to cut off work to do something. Um, two, we played these games that for two hours at a time, I was completely present. Mm. I was not thinking about work. I was immersed in this activity with these other people. And so again, what it allowed uh, me to do is start that rejuvenation process. Um, mm-hmm. I'm happy to talk about the three M's of rest, um, you know, at, a, at another point, but I was doing uh, what is essentially um, a micro 
break. I was taking a break from the work. Um, mm-hmm. I was immersed in something that was enjoyable. It was playful. Yeah. Um, and then afterwards, um, like I felt, I felt great. Um, and then I went home and the first improv class, I, I kid you not, my wife thought I was drunk. Like I, uh, I, I, I came home, I walked in, I was so excited. I, my body was, I guess I was drunk on my own, on my own sort of chemicals and drugs. Natural you know, dop- dopamine. Yeah. Yeah. Dopamine, yeah. uh, yeah. you know, uh, oxytocin, uh, norepinephrine, you know, all those things. Um, and I was like, no, no, I didn't have anything to drink. I took that improv class. It, and she's like, was it scary? Was it fun? And I was like, I was describing the game. She's like, I guess she's like, what? Uh, it's not like uh, these silly kids games, but I was like, it was so much fun. Yeah. And then now I had something to look forward to every Monday improv. Yeah. Every, so Sundays when people are like stressing out and like, oh, yes. I gotta work. Yes. I'm like, oh, it's Monday. So, so, and then it just started to seep into, into my day to day. So that was the catalyst. Um, it wasn't for like another like two or three years before like I became like the improv guy and really started to explore what is this? Why why is this magical thing happening? Uh, even when I didn't think it would happen, it still like connects people and stuff like that. Uh, right. But that was the start. That's a little again a little taste of my my story. And like I said, even with the knowledge, I still found myself burning out multiple times. So I, I went from seeing the world as a playground to a proving ground. Playground to a proving ground. That's so fair though, Gary. It's so honest. And I t- truly do appreciate it because we need these reminders. We're human. We need to keep working on these things. It's not like you do it once and you're and you fix the problem. You know, it's I ate that one salad. Now I'm good. Now I don't have to eat healthy, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I did that CrossFit. What? Yeah. You know, where, where are those abs? No. <laughs> yeah, five years ago I did that CrossFit. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. So let's all right, so let's just kind of uh, backtrack for a second on the structure. You had your your day job. You were in a, mar- a marketing exec, right? Mm-hmm. And you had your improv that was just Mondays once a week, and you started exploring that further. How did you implement more of that play into your life and, like, where you are now where you're, like, Seriously, play is the key to productivity, creativity. You know, there's so many benefits. How did you go from that once a week improv to like now you're like, okay, we really need to incorporate play on would you wouldn't you say even on a, a regular basis, on a daily basis? Oh, for sure. Um, and so it started with baby steps. So okay. and beautiful things about play is it is inherently enjoyable. <laughs> uh and it's something that when you're invited into it, you may be a little bit hesitant, but like when you truly embrace it, because we are wired for play, play is like our natural sort of state of being, we're playful, we're considered neotenous creatures, which means that we retain our juvenile features into adulthood. Um, and so mm-hmm. I just loved, I love these games, I thought these games were great. And then I started immediately seeing the benefit to learning how to be a better listener to learning this thing called yes and as it pertains to collaboration and as a newer leader and wanting to be the best uh boss i could be i started bringing some of these games to my team and and again it it was just like friday like hey you know we're trying to blow off some steam or something like that hey let's play this game um that i learned in improv and then i would do it and and you know then we started it becoming became more of a ritual where before a big meeting we would do some improv games as a way to loosen up um or you know it be it became part of our process of brainstorming mm-hmm. of like oh yeah. gary what was that improv game that helped us do x y and z and then it so it became embedded into our culture yeah then I that saw the benefits. Sense. Yeah. Oh, it, well, firsthand with your team. That makes so much sense, Gary. I love that because that was like the natural progression of, hey, I've learned this over here in, in one part of my life. And you just started implementing it in other areas. Yeah. And, and it's then, like we're yeah. one human. We're not multiple humans. So. Agreed. And it was one of those things where – it was before I learned more of the psychological benefits of, of like what's really happening. I was just curious and I just started bringing this and, and sharing it with whoever would listen. And then for me, so 
then I, it started expanding where I just needed more improv. So I took every class I could take. Uh, I mm -hmm. went to like improv camp. Um, that's a thing. Where it's like nice. a sleepaway camp. Um, it was called Camp Improv Utopia. And it's um, Memorial Day weekend here on the West Coast. And, and, you know, you do these improv workshops and then it's mixed with like sort of uh, camp stuff. Uh, so if you've ever been to summer camp, like, you know, th that's a vibe. Like it's, it's Same great. Idea. And then I, awesome. I started performing again. It was me rediscovering my form of play. So I thought improv was the answer for everyone. Right. Um, turns out like the games are very beneficial, but it's not necessarily everyone's form of play. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for some people they like, Oh, that's great. We did this workshop, but you know, I don't want to go, you know, be on stage and do it. Like, I, I like that we did it in our little groups. And so then I started, so I thought improv was the answer because mm -hmm. our team started gelling, our, st our team started uh, trusting each other more. We had psychological safety. We were, you know, being more productive. Um, and then I found out that, well, improv is just one form of play. And, and I read, yeah. read this book by Dr. Stuart Brown, um, you know, called Play and How It Shapes Our Brain and stuff like that. And then I mm -hmm. realized, oh, it's play like it, like that's what it is and and we need to um un unlock like what is the form of play that works for us and and how can we bring forms of that into our life into like our personal life as far as like hobbies and stuff like that and into like our professional lives that's fantastic i love that gary so for any creators out there storytellers and artists and entrepreneurs it can be really challenging when mm -hmm. you essentially have a business and you have all these normal obligations that come with a business you have to bring in revenue you have to pay bills you you might be a leader like you were yes um you know working with other employees managing employees play sounds just like another thing to add to the to-do list it, it like first you know first glance at it like oh, really i don't have time to play what would you say to someone who says that um you're right uh you don't have time because you haven't made space for it um and so for the people and and most of the time they're probably experiencing burnout which means that they're overworking as it is and so i mentioned the three m's um to you know sort of rest um and i i learned this um I learned this about a year ago. It was funny because I knew it like just um, intuitively and it turns out there's a name for it. So there's three types of rest. Mm -hmm. It's called um, micro, macro, and mezzo. So okay. micro are what are those breaks in between the work to rejuvenate? Um, Microsoft actually did a study uh, during the pandemic um, since we we're doing more and more video calls. And they found that uh, by the fifth or sixth video call, people are depleted. They're, they did sure. brain scans. And the the folks who did not have micro breaks, um, their brain scans are just like red, like like as if like it's just burnt to a crisp done. Um, however, the people that had micro breaks, um, every meeting it was it was refreshed. So that's mm -hmm. the first thing. And again, that's a place where play can show up um, is, you know, when you're thinking of play, you're most of the time, most people think this big commitment, like, oh, I don't have two hours or something like that. Right. I don't thing. have time for a class or yeah. 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 But you have five minutes. Right. And so this, the alternative is because we are bad judges of our ability to do things uh, bad. Like, you know, a, we are very bad at, you know, our sort of capacity to, to take on things and how well we're going to do it. And most of the time, you know, when people are like, well, you know, what? let me just power through. No, it, it there's again scientific data that shows that we're more prone to mistakes. Our the quality of our work is not going to be as sharp, um, you know, had we've taken the break. So, um, you know, it's like the tortoise and the hare sort of situation. It's like, all right, you know what? Keep going, keep burning yourself out. I'm gonna take that five minute break. I'm gonna take that ten minute break. Get get my brain sort of um, sort of rejuvenated. And guess what? Your brain's still working on it. Your brain's still working on that creative uh, uh, endeavor, pursuit, whatever it is. And then when you jump back in, it's going to be as if you had a cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah. And then you know what happens when you have a cliffhanger? Your brain's like, ooh, what's going to happen? Like, Filling you know? in the gap, sure. Yeah, and then boom, you're going to jump back in and you're going to hit the ground running uh, more so than the person who just like 
didn't take a break and just kept going. So that's the, the first one, micro breaks. Play is a great thing there. Uh, and by play, it can be anything that you just do for the sake of doing it. Like it can be stretching, it can be walking. Like if you have a hard time saying play, hey, how about you just give yourself some self-care, some exercise? It doesn't matter. Sure. Do something other than your work. <laughs> right. Um, and then um, so micro and then um, macro, that sleep. Um, mm. I, I know, you know, the, um, you know, they, they say eight hours, yada, yada, yada. And, right. and a number of people I, I talk to, um, you know, well, I don't have time for eight hours. Well, you don't have, it seems like you don't have time for a lot of things. Uh, but it's common thread. Yeah. Yeah. That is not for me to judge. Um, <laughs> yeah. however, is, are you getting the best quality sleep you can with the sleep that you're getting? If you don't have time for eight hours of sleep, you only have time for six hours of sleep or whatever the case may be. Is it the best six hours is the best four hours of sleep that you can get because guess what when you are sleeping that's when your brain is repairing things that's when your brain is like again working on whatever that challenge is that you have right. um and if you're not allowing yourself to have that space to do it you're going to be running at three-quarter speed while the rest of us are you know um you know high performers and so um and this is something again it's a practice there like I again know this you know common sense is not always common practice um and it's like what are the things what are the rituals that you're doing prior to laying your head down at night that is going to enable you to have the best sleep you know are you the type of person that um you know the moment you like are done like you know like a robot like it's like all right power down like you just like and you collapse you, yeah. right is that how or or do you like start to ease into it you know uh, set the devices down what are some rituals that you can do at night to again to get you ready for the best sleep possible um and it, again it's a practice it's something that um i'm consistently working on of you know starting to like say all right from this time to this time this is personal time um uh, with you know me and my wife like you know watch something that's gonna just you know we can sort of zone out or whatever the case may be we're watching a lot of ted lasso lately if there's any mm -hmm. ted lasso fans um mm -hmm. uh but again it is a practice so that when you hit the the pillow and you can go to sleep you can stay asleep and you can get into that rim sleep um right so and then this is the one that is the most challenging but i believe that it's possible um and that is mezzo rest and so mezzo rest is um, taking a day off mm. and doing something that um, invigorates you, um, you know, something that is allowing you to be creative. You know, maybe you go, you know, go outside. Like, again, um, I, I know I, I'm very privileged and spoiled living in Southern California where the weather is is pretty awesome most of the time. So, um, however, not everyone has that. But what are you doing away from it? And again, um, you know, I don't have time for, I, you know, I have a lot of stuff going on. Totally get it. You know, maybe it's not a full day. Maybe it's a half day. Maybe yeah. it's three hours, but again, yeah. having a practice of doing that. And this is for the people who say you don't have time. I, I'm not a betting man. However, I would like to bet that you do. And, and, sure. and I found that out myself when, um, when, <laughs> uh, we, we had a situation, um, where, uh, this again was back in my sort of marketing sort of days um where i was in the office a lot and then um at our place we had a raccoon that was on the roof and um it was during the daytime too and it was it was freaking us out because our dog was sort of barking and um and it, it didn't look well so i like i essentially had to put everything aside to you know get someone to come out and take care of it and it took half a day mm -hmm. to get that to happen Great. um and then I had to go to work, you know, afterwards. Yes. And so I yeah. made time for that to happen. Right. Like, however, at that time, I wouldn't make time to take a PTO, you know, to right. go somewhere right. with family. So again, you can make time. It's usually the emergencies that pop up where we all of a sudden, I found eight hours. So those are the three breaks. Those are the ways to ease into play. Yeah, that's fantastic too, Gary. I wonder on the example with taking time off that it's different when it's you individually like each one of us making that decision to say i am taking a break versus that external influence saying 
you know, the raccoon, all the unexpected, the many things that can happen. I wonder if there's something there where it's like internally, we have to like almost psych ourselves up for it or like give ourselves permission to actually take the time to rest mm -hmm. or to play. Frankly, if, if we have that internal voice saying, you know, keep working and the play is later. I feel like there's almost like this internal dialogue going, you know, it's like you have a, have an angel on one shoulder and a little devil on the other. I feel like it's almost like that little battle going on until we give ourselves that permission. It's kind of awkward and hard and weird to say I'm taking the day off or the part of the day off or whatever I'm doing um, before we actually do it. You're absolutely right. And I like to say the devil is not the one that's trying to convince you to take the day off. The, the devil on your shoulder is the one that's making you feel not good enough. <laughs> that is a, mm, really? Um, you take a day off? Um, who's going to pay the bills? You know, you, you work for yourself. Uh, and, and so let's just be honest, you know, call a spade a spade yeah. and name that. Um, you know, uh, I, I have a name for him. Uh, his name is Eugene. Um, and I like to tell Eugene, I say, hey, Eugene, I got this. It's all good. Um, and another thing is you're absolutely right. Like if I left it up to myself, I would just work, work, work and work. I had to set up, um, you know, structures, uh, frameworks, scaffolding, if you will, mm -hmm. that created that environment for that to happen. And it didn't happen overnight. Like it was something that was like an ongoing thing. I started by first putting repeating things in my calendar that were open spaces where that was a uh, time for me to sort of recharge um, at times when I knew I needed it. And the interesting thing, because at first I'm like, oh my gosh, is, is this going to work out? But the funny thing is it was in the calendar. And so it popped up. And so things scheduled around it. Right. Just like all the other appointments. All yeah. The <laughs> and then they were there. And then at first I, I felt a little guilty, but I like sort of eased into it. And then the next thing was, ooh, can I take a, a day off here and there? Um, and so again, I started, I, I put it in and then it was a repeating a once a month thing. It started with like two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, like two and a half, like, again, we probably waste that with just getting into our day. But like, again, yeah. you're right. I had to have it. And then I was like, oh, and then I started seeing the benefits. I'm like, this actually work. This is working. Um, all right. Well, let's make it a little bit more because you're absolutely right. Like if I were to go to you right now, all right, you know what? Put it on your calendar. You're going to take a day off of this month. It might be too much. It might shock you too much. You might stress out more, like, even though we know we need it. So I just like to just sort of ease it in and then stretch it over time. It's like a rubber band. Like, you know, you just keep stretching it and then yeah, pretty soon yeah. it, it, it moves. And I like to tell people if, you know, because we're, you know, we're emotional creatures that justify stuff. And, and I like to say, um, imagine this, uh, imagine that you hurt yourself or you did something and you wouldn't be able to take care of your, um, your family or your, or your loved ones. That would be a shame, right? Yeah, sure. And wouldn't you want to do everything in your power to prevent that? And you're like, Oh yeah. Uh, and I said like, especially people who've worked out, like when you work out, you, you do the preventative stuff, like you stretch and you do all these other things. Right. Well, this is working out your brain. Like, why aren't you doing? Why aren't you doing this stuff that's going to put you in optimal condition? And and I get it. It's it's like a society thing. Like it's be it's part of our sort of lexicon of stuff of like uh, from the Protestant work ethic and all that other stuff. It's sure. ingrained. So sure. this is not an overnight thing. Uh, so I, I totally get it. But it takes time. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful points there, Gary. Because it's it. There's so much of these things where accepting as truth or the way things must be, you know, because they've been this way, they need to stay this way. Um, I like that. I really love that rubber band analogy too. I mean, that's, that's fantastic. So on the topic of play here, it still can be a little awkward. It still can be a little different. I love how practical you're being with like, okay, just implement it five minutes here, five minutes there. Okay. Somebody, they're not in their head like, okay, okay, I can do this. I can do this. But still, how do they get started? Because, you know, you Google play or something. You know what I mean? It's like you're asking for a million distractions. Where is there like a an approach you recommend that like, okay, 
you know, do something you've always enjoyed, do something that makes you feel different. What, what advice would you give to somebody who's like, okay, yes, I'm going to incorporate some play, but I'm not well, sure where really. Well, young grasshopper, uh, <laughs> the answer has always been inside of you this whole time. Um, uh, Dr. Stuart Brown in his book, um, you know, talks about uh, taking a play history. Mm. What are the things that you used to do that brought you joy? And how can you some way, you know, somehow incorporate it into your, you know, day to day now. And it may require a little bit of creativity. Sure. Um, so for example, um, like take for example, my wife, my wife, she loved when she was young, she, she loved playing with dolls and she loved like sort of nurturing things like that. She had like a Polly mm -hmm. pocket. You remember those? Yeah, I remember like the Polly. Little, little... Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, uh, she wanted to incorporate more sort of a playful approach in her life. And yeah. what she ended up doing, no, she didn't go out and buy more dolls. Actually, no, I take that out. Uh, I take that back. She did <laughs> she did get uh, an American Girl doll for Christmas. I, I happened to buy it. Uh, it was it was it named was Courtney. It, okay. it was named Courtney. Her name's Courtney. It's like an 80s thing. She likes to eat. It but was meant to be. Yeah, it was yeah, meant yeah. to be. However, but the thing that she found that was the same sort of vibes, the same sort of essence was she became uh, a nurturer of plants. Oh my gosh, you should see how many plants we have. We have like succulents galore. And she like dove into it. And for her, that was play. Like she she found that sort of playful spirit that she had when she was a kid um, with the, with these plants. And then she like seriously got into it. Like she, like there's apps and stuff that can tell you when you're not watering enough. And, and we, and like, and That's also- incredible. Now, like, uh, we have this like bird sanctuary. Like, yeah. she has like uh, uh, like bird feeders and stuff. Like, again, that's all play. And she has like this spotting scope where she can like sit out on on the patio. It seems a little creep creepy, but uh, it's but it's a just a little bit. I'm, I remember I'm a crime writer, so. It's but it's for birds. It's for it's for birds. It's, it's for, for birds. birds. Uh, honestly, honestly, <laughs> uh, is is we're just looking at birds. Uh, but uh, again, that is play. You know, doing something for like where the action is. Um, the reward. And so if you're watching, and you're like, oh, yeah, I want to do it. I'm not sure what to do. Again, take a play history. Um, you know, it's 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 been there. Um, you know, sometimes I like to say, what were the things that you did that brought you joy? I like to say things that brought you joy, because again, uh, sometimes our sort of perception of play has to be sports or something like that. And for some people, that's just sure. wasn't their jam. But what were the things that you did just for the sake of doing it? close to the age of 12 to 13 that you probably don't do now. The mm -hmm. reason why I say that is that's when you're going through puberty. That's when the brain is starting to go through that first sort of heartening phase where um, it's keeping things that it thinks you will need for adulthood. And if you were doing it around that time, your brain probably thought like, oh, this is probably going to come in handy, but you probably stopped doing it because it just, you know, life or, or adulting. And, and how can you bring that back um, mm -hmm. in any way, shape or form? Yeah. Um, so, you know, that, that is the tip. Um, and um, I do, uh, so Dr. Stuart Brown talks about, um, he talks about like the different sort of play personalities. And yeah. so I have a guide, um, I have to look it up. Uh, it's, it's on my site somewhere, I'll, I'll find it and I'll, and I'll, um, I'll put it in like in the, the comments yeah. or something like That'd that, awesome. that goes through the different play personalities. Um, and what I tell people there is, read through them, which one excites you, which one uh, piques your curiosity and how can you do something using that different play personality? You know, some of them, I'll just give a, a taste of a few um, ones like the jokester. So that's again, when people think about play, that's one that comes up a lot like mischief, like um, sure. your form of play is practical jokes. Uh, your form of play is like, um, you know, what, what can you do to, you know, sort of cause mischief uh, again, uh, growing up, um, the joker was one of my dominant play personalities, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not for everyone. Um, another one, believe it or not, is the collector. Um, your form of play is collecting things and it doesn't necessarily have to be like memorabilia it could be collecting experiences you know to mm -hmm. you that is play um another one which is um also you know associated with play is uh, the the competitor uh with the competitor is you like to compete um you know on the field or you like to compete with yourself um again these there's this fine line um where you go a little bit too far it's not play anymore like when it becomes com right. compulsive like right. uh you know that's not play uh, again remembering play is just doing something for the sake of doing it but the competitor like again you love a good competition like to you it's, it's play i have a friend who's like that who who just like loves to just compete just to compete like he's right. like hey i'll race you to here like 
right. my son's making like, up games of competition all yeah. the time. Yeah. My four year old, like everything is a competition. But like again, <laughs> whether he wins or lose, it doesn't matter. It's the fact that we're competing. <laughs> and a lot of times, because he wants to, and this is a good sign of play is, um, and kids, kids intuitively know this. Kids will uh, adjust accordingly to keep the game going. It reminds me of one of my favorite movies, Sandlot. Mm-hmm. Um, if you if you've seen it, like again, they just wanted to keep the base, game of baseball going, um, yeah. right? How what can we do to adjust so that the game keeps going? And that's what my son does. Is like I'm about to, um, like he's about to beat me, and he just like, oh, I'm about to win that. Like again, you know, it's very competitive, but like. It's it's different. So, anyways, uh, I'll find that guide and and I'll put yeah, it that'd be awesome. um, in there. It, it has all the different play personalities, and I invite you to like look at it and find out like, oh yeah, this these are some different ways of playing that um you know can get your mojo going. Yeah, I love that. I think that's a, a great starting point for someone who's like, let's just dig a little deeper into this. Let's start exploring, and I think. I know you've said this before, Gary, I'm going to quote you from the past, but I think, you know, part of this is really experimentation. You're not, you might not pick the right thing the very first time. Yep. And, you know, improv was not your first choice. <laughs> you, you were surprised. You said, you're like, I didn't know. I was nervous to kind of have that be the thing that opened the door for you to remember all about play. Um, so I think that's really cool though. That's so exciting. Cause it's, we can try different things. We can experiment and, mm-hmm. and it's fun. So yeah, that's awesome. play, play is messy. Play like, so one of the um, things I like to talk about is what are the barriers to play? Mm. What are the things that keeps us from playing? And one of the biggest things or two, two big things uh, I'll sort of tease here is perfection yeah. and expectations. Ooh, both. Yes. Both of those. I think they're like two sides of the same coin or something like that. Um, <laughs> where if you're trying to be perfect, mm-hmm you're not going to be playing because again, you're going to get out of that sort of flow. Uh, And especially as an adult, like I get it. We are so used to doing something very well because again, we've worked on it. We forgot what it was like to be a beginner. And then we try something new and we're not good at it. And what happens? We're like, "Mm, expectations. You wanted mm, to be perfect. We're trying to be perfect. We had these expectations (laughs) that it was going to be amazing. Again, in our head, we we see ourselves picking up that guitar and strumming some chords like Jimi Hendrix. And and then again, we want to be perfect. And, and then it, the reality (laughs) is that is not. And so that is, um, that's going to be a barrier to play because you're not going to want to play. You're going to stop playing. Uh, you become an adult instantly, and and then it's it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be enjoyable. And so yeah, you're right. Like experiment. I like dare to dare to suck. Um, and just a quick story on this. Uh, when the pandemic happened, so I I go through these phases where like I I, I met with adversity and I have to follow my own advice. And and I said, Gary, what was something that you love doing as a child that brought you joy that maybe you're not doing. And this was like the start of the pandemic. And I was, I was like, Oh my gosh, everything. Like I just thought the business was like picking up. And then now everything that I like work hard, it like is, is shifted. done. Like, right. sh- like, right. well, that's exactly it. it shifted. But like in that moment, like, of course, you know, we can all have a pity party. I like to say, um, it's okay to be a mess. You just can't stay there. Right. <laughs> so I was having that mess moment. And then again, the, the little angel showed up and like, Hey Gary, Hey play, you know, what was something that you, um, that you did when you were younger that you don't do now that you can break out and you can, you know, start to experiment with. And, uh, it was magic and it was something that, um, so, you know, our, our mutual friend, um, Harris, the third, you know, is an amazing magician. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I, uh, I remember I was reading his book, uh, Wonder Switch, and he was mm-hmm. talking about that, and I was like, "Oh yeah, that was something that, like, again, when I was doing magic as a kid, it wasn't like I'm gonna be a big like I again as the prankster, as the jokester, like I did it more to get like a like a sort of a rise out of people. Um, it was it was great, and so I said, you know what, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna be a bad magician, like, like, and that was the again low set the the bar super low. low, like Very the expectation low. was like. I'm not trying to like go out and like this be my thing. I just want to like bring back that magic, that that spark. And so like I um, uh, happened to see like um, a Zoom uh, magic show and it was like really good. And uh, the gentleman who did it like uh, had like a magic set, like a quarantine magic set 
for sale. I think it was mostly geared towards kids, but I bought sure, it. Sure. And then like I started doing like these magic tricks. And it, again, it wasn't for anyone other than me and, and my son because he's easily amused. Um, and and it brought back joy. It brought back that spark of like, ah. And then that, again, that's where the idea came from. I was like, hmm, maybe I can do this virtually. Um, maybe I can start to like experiment with yeah. Yeah, yeah. doing what I do in a virtual environment. So anyways, that I, another personal story. Uh, of again, it, it's an ongoing reminder of 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 like play is a necessity and and it can be the thing that can get you out of a rut. I love it. I love it, Gary. And that it's just so refreshing and being willing to suck and just having fun and doing things that originally were just for kids. It's it lowers that expectation so much, and you can kind of just open yourself up to new experiences. And I can't thank you enough, Gary, for being on the story making show. Is there anything that um, you would like to plug or share how people can connect with you as far as I know you offer some coaching. I know you also offer lots of events for corporations. Where, where, would, where can people go to connect with you? Yeah, go to my website breakthroughplay.com. Um, you know, check out what I got uh, got to offer. Um, I do have uh, so if you were curious about this stuff and you're like, oh, you know, what's what's up with this? I I do have a, a guide on my site um, uh, about understanding what your different play personalities are, um, and like I said, I'll, I'll drop that um, into um, into the chat. Um, if you if you beat me beat me there uh it is on my site under the resources you know go 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 check it out um but yeah reach out like i i love talking to people about this um i i love helping people sort of find their way and shift their thinking from seeing the world as a proving ground um to a world um that's a playground of possibilities i love it thank you so much again yeah thank you